so many people are stuck in shutdown and they each think that they're alone. They each think they're different or that they're hopeless. And you might be one of those people, but it's not hopeless and you're not alone. Your shutdown experiences are probably really similar to other people in shutdown. And actually, I can prove it. I sent out a shutdown experiences survey to my email list. I got about 75 people that responded to it. Uh, real people experiencing real shutdown. This is actually part four of my shutdown experiences survey results. I recommend watching the other three first. In this one, I'm going to focus on what they told me are the most helpful resources. I hope you feel validated and less alone after this episode. And a big, big thanks to everyone that uh, took the time to complete my shutdown experiences survey. Hey, I'm Justin. I'm a therapist and coach and the creator of the Polyvagal Trauma Relief System. Welcome to Stuck Not Broken, where I teach you how to live with more calm, confidence, and connection without psychobabble or woo-woo. Of course, this is not therapy, nor is it intended to be a replacement for therapy. The first survey results that I want to go into are... Or well, the question is, which of these supports have you tried and what was most helpful? So it's two questions that I'm going to look at together. Those options are therapy, coaching, informative content like articles and blogs, interactive content like workshops and webinars, group support like forums or flat out support groups, self-help tools like apps and journals, religious or spiritual counseling, retreats, structured slash guided substance use like cannabis or MDMA, ayahuasca, that kind of stuff. Or I haven't tried anything. And then I also gave people the option to fill in other things that they may have tried out. So out of all those options, the highest that people pick was 86% informative content. Oh, by the way, respondents could pick as many as they would like or as many as they've actually tried. It wasn't limited to just one. So 86% of people said they have tried out informative content. That makes total sense. They probably, you know, found stuff on YouTube, like my stuff, or on Instagram, even like the one minute real kind of things. That's, I would call that informative, potentially informative content, books, blogs, that kind of stuff. That's kind of usually, I think the starting point is we just learn. We're learning uh, before we do anything or put anything into practice, just learning informative content. So 86% said that they had tried that. 58% of respondents said that that was actually the most helpful. It's possible that after just learning or taking in informative content that people will just stop there. It's uh, actually, I think it's really common. We, we learn, we learn, we learn, but we don't take action on it. 74% of respondents said they had tried therapy. So well, and this, this, my audience is not exactly a general audience. It's people that are, are actively looking for ways to improve their life or to get unstuck. So having thir- three out of four people who have tried therapy at that, I don't, I'm not shocked by that. Uh, of those 74%, about half of them said that that was their most helpful uh, option or most helpful support. I've heard from many people that are in therapy who get some kind of benefit from it or don't get benefit and actually maybe feel re traumatized. Like that, that's possible. That is definitely within the realm of possibility. And they find content like this that they find really helpful. They, they learn about the polyvagal theory and shutdown state and how to recover, but that, that stuff's not covered in therapy. So it, it kind of makes sense to me why more people would say that informative content is actually the most helpful because it just makes sense, but they don't know how to implement it. So maybe it's helpful because it normalizes them and validates their experiences, but what to do with it, that's, that's a different thing. And therapists, well, we're not all trained on, on this kind of somatic and polyvagal theory kind of stuff. At the lowest end, which... I think it's pretty predictable is retreats at 13% and guided substance use at 21%. Both of these things involve a pretty hefty amount of investment in time in trust in another and money as well. So that, yeah, it would make total sense why that would be at the lower end. Again, respondents could pick as many categories as they want. So this is really relevant because what I found most interesting out of all this is that the highest number of categories picked were nine and 10 and 20 through almost a quarter, almost one in four people had tried nine or 10 supports. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. It really struck me. On top of that, almost 41% 
of respondents tried nine or more. So 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, possibly more. Almost 41% of people had tried nine or more and were still stuck in some noticeable amount of shutdown. That, I thought it was really striking. Uh, it also kind of makes sense. Shutdown's not easy, especially if we're not recognizing that it's shutdown. If someone's treating it as like a chemical imbalance and just medicating, medicating, medi- tweaking medications, doing more medication, if their therapist is telling them that you're depressed and this is forever and you just got to manage it with more medication and coping skills and whatnot, then yeah, it's not much is going to change. You might continually seek out, well, what's the thing that's going to help me out? Shutdown is not easy to come out of. It's probably the slowest. It's the furthest down the polyvagal ladder. Maybe, maybe that's one reason why. But when we're in shutdown, there's a lot of hopelessness. We feel empty. We feel alone. We don't believe in ourselves. So continually trying the next thing or relying on the next expert, these things add up. You know, and I think that might have a lot to do with it. And if we don't get results really quickly, we might give up and go to the next thing. But the reality is that shutdown is, it's a long process. Coming out of shutdown is not easy. It is not a quick, obviously it's not a quick thing. It's not easy. It's a long process. And there is, um, there might be some patience lacking for that. And I don't, I don't blame anybody for that whatsoever. On top of that, the signs of coming out of shutdown are increased flight fight activation. So there might be more irritation or frustration or agitation. It's actually a good sign. It's potentially a very good sign as long as you're balancing out with more and more safety activation. That's actually a pretty good sign, but it doesn't feel like that. Someone might see that they are experiencing more agitation of of some kind and think, well, this isn't working or it's, I'm doing the wrong thing. But really that returning mobilization is potentially a really good sign. So if they see that, they might just jump to the next technique or support trying to fix that or thinking that, well, whatever I'm doing is failing, so I'll try something else. So yeah, 41% of people said they had tried nine or more different supports. The next question I asked is, how likely are you to ask for support? And only 9% of respondents are likely to ask for support. The vast majority of respondents, 91%, is unlikely to ask for support in shutdown, this kind of makes sense. We feel very alone. We feel very cut off because, well, we are cut off. Part of shutdown oftentimes is isolation. The body, when in shutdown, needs to immobilize. And solitude might be a really good idea, not isolation, not where you're like locking yourself away in a room in the dark, but solitude where you're maybe going to a lake or a beach or just a walk around the block or just sitting in the backyard. Something where you're immobile and alone, but okay with it, where it's peaceful and relaxing versus, you know, depressing and isolated, like in your room in the dark alone. So it totally makes sense why people would not reach out for support. The reality is that being alone is helpful, but having a couple of supports uh, of people that you trust and are close to is not a bad idea at all. That can help come out of shutdown, connecting with others, receiving their co-regulation. On that note, the next question is, do you have people in your life that can provide co-regulation? Over half said yes. The other half said no or maybe. So it's interesting that half said yes, I have people in in my life that can provide co-regulation, but the vast majority of those people are not willing to ask for it. And that makes sense. Of course, if you're going to say, you know, call someone up and say, hey, can you provide me with co-regulation? That's they're not going to get it, probably. You're going to feel weird doing that, probably. But can you reconnect with someone in your life? Can you meet up with someone for lunch? Can you just call and hear their voice and say, hey, I just you know want to check in with you, see how you're doing, or I miss you, or something like that? Like, yeah, I think it's possible. But yeah, calling someone and asking for co-regulation is probably not going to, probably not going to go well. Over half said yes, the other half said no, or maybe. The next question is, how likely are you to receive co-regulation from a safe other? About 25% said that they are likely to receive co-regulation from another, but that leaves, which is good, but that leaves 75% of respondents that will not or might receive co-regulation from a safe other. So more people can receive it, 
than ask for it, which I think is something, and it does make actually a lot of sense. In, in no matter what defensive state we're in, usually we can receive some level of co-regulation, whether we're aware of it or not. But asking for it, putting yourself out there, risking vulnerability, that is a much taller order. The next thing I asked was, what experiences have you had with non-professional supports? And then after that, I asked for what experiences have you had with professional supports? I'm going to summarize the responses because I got a lot, and then I'm going to read three or four from each category in the words of the respondent. So the summary of what experiences have you had with non-professional supports, the summary is uh, many of my respondents found support from friends, partners, or peers helpful, especially those who understand trauma and co-regulation. So if you know someone who has this knowledge, that's going to be more helpful. How many of us have that? Well, in this audience, maybe there's a higher number than in the general population. The next thing about the next summary from non-professional supports is that some people prefer handling their shutdown on their own first through activities like movement, dance, or yoga before reaching out to others. Makes total sense. And actually, I think this is a really good idea. Using or receiving co-regulation from others is great, but having that solitude to yourself might be the first step. Actually, might be a really good idea. Solitude, again, is not isolation. Isolation is dark room, cutting out the world, binging on your phone. Solitude is, I'm going to be by myself, give myself permission to feel all my feelings or whatever comes up in the present moment, and then dance, and then uh, journal about it, or and, and then uh, do some yoga, stretch out. Like That's what solitude is. I'm going to go somewhere safe, like a beach, if you have access to it, and just sit and be and think and feel. That's solitude. The next uh, summary point here is that resources like books and courses and online communities provide valuable insights. So it helps them to learn. It helps them just that top-down learning helps them manage their defensive activation or their shutdown. The next piece is that romantic partners can offer comfort, but their responses can either help or worsen depending on the romantic partner's stability. So if you have someone who's has a lot of access to their safety state and can co-regulate, that's going to be more comforting than, than someone who doesn't, obviously, right? All right, four quotes from people who are sharing about their non-professional support. Helene, who's been shut down between 11 and 30 years, says, one of my best resources today are a couple of friends who are doing this work as well. We support each other and create the safe space and offer co-regulation. So powerful. Carol, who's been in shutdown for three to six months, says she does a bit of online yoga. Shortened to the point, a bit of online yoga. A, who's been in shutdown for 31 to 40 years, says meditation techniques, for example, R-A-I-N, and my UDS, Unstucking Defensive States course. The hardest thing is remembering slash thinking to use them in the moment. Absolutely. Learning these things is great, and I think there's some benefit, some top-down benefit, but yeah, you got to implement <laughs> You got to practice this stuff as well. And I really encourage people practice it before the problem. Don't wait until you're like a seven out of 10 shutdown. Practice this stuff when you're at a two out of 10 shutdown or three out of 10 shutdown. Or when you have more safety than not, practice, be mindful. You utilize this, the skills that you're learning before you need them. And then when you need them, it'll be more accessible. And finally, Supernova, who's been in shutdown within the past year, said, the content and helping me understand why I am like this reduces my shame very significantly. Thank you, Supernova, for sharing and for my other uh, respondents as well. So that was non-professional supports. When it comes to professional supports, I have a summary and then I'll give you three quotes from people who responded. The summary is basically that some people found professional help, especially somatic-based therapies and holistic approaches to be effective particularly when they're focused on co-regulation, touch, and attunement. That's, I think that's kind of interesting, the touch aspect of it. A couple of people said that. But co-regulation, as long as you have a safe other, that's going, to be, uh, that's going to be more helpful than not, obviously. The somatic mindfulness, being aware of your body, I think that's going to be more helpful than um, thinking you have some sort of illness or disease or you have to like get rid of your feelings. If you can be aware of them, compassionately, that actually can help them to soften and alleviate. Several people shared that traditional just talk therapy, 
partially helped, but they felt like something was missing. And I think that somatic piece is the thing that's missing personally. A few people mentioned that therapy worsened their experience or left them feeling misunderstood or even blamed. They emphasized that finding the right therapist or maybe even the right approach is really important. I would argue the right therapist is more important than the right approach. The right approach, even if you found someone that was polyvagal informed and really good with somatic stuff, that doesn't mean they're a good fit for you. Uh, So I think the techniques only go so far as the relationship does personally, but having a balance of both would be ideal. A couple of people said that coaching, they actually prefer that over therapy when coaching is focused on change and education. So really like goals and present moment stuff. And other people said that they have not even allowed professionals to witness their full shutdown state. Like they kind of keep it in check or they hold it back. And of course that leads to them not feeling like it was addressed or recognized. Yeah. I mean, part of this is, you know, how much you bring to the table as far as what you're sharing The therapist or maybe coach should also be able to recognize what, you know, some experiences of of shutdown if they're informed in this stuff. If not, then it just looks like depression and they're going to say it's a chemical imbalance and, you know, you got to cope with this for the rest of your life. Specific quotes from the professional supports, uh, Steph, who's been in shutdown for up to 50 years, says spiritual psychotherapy has been my guiding star as has been pranic healing slash energy work to literally shift my energy when I cannot. Jessica, in shutdown for up to 30 years, says, For about seven years, I have had therapy once a week. My therapy is somatic experiencing. And I still laughed myself because I started with my therapist before I knew any of this stuff. But somatic experiencing and polyvagal kind of go hand in hand. So it works out very well for me. I have found my therapy to be very helpful. I am a huge proponent of coaching, but personally, I think I need more supports or have needed more intense support than what a coach could offer. I am also very limited on time, but if I didn't have therapy, I would certainly do coaching because I think that would be so beneficial and supportive for my growth and recovery. Really happy for Jessica. She found something that works for her and it really like sounds like aligns with what she needs. And yeah, I, I agree. I agree with, with, uh, with, with Jessica here that Coaching is helpful, but is not for if you need more some you might need more support than that. Coaching is good for present and, and goal oriented, but crises and uh, mental like it's you know it's more serious mental health kind of stuff. Like obviously that that's not a coaching thing. So the therapy route and having more intensive sports could be totally appropriate for someone. Coaching is great for someone for the person that's like ready to change for the person that is. Like they're just sick of it and they're ready to put something into action. Coaching is, I, I like how it's, it's so direct and like we're here to like make steps forward. And as long as you have someone who's aligned with that, I, I think coaching can be, can be really effective. I, I find it really enjoyable personally. Oh, and, and Jessica, you're right. Yeah. Therapy, uh, S, somatic experiencing and polyvagal theory, I think definitely do go hand in hand. So thank you so much for my respondents for sharing your experiences of shutdown. I think I have one more episode of this. Uh, of this series to wrap up the shutdown experiences survey. I'll have that out pretty soon. But yeah, thank you for people who responded. And, and I know I'm speaking for the person watching this and the next person watching this as you know, a thank you for the people who filled this out. And yeah, when you get a moment, like read some of the comments on YouTube is, on these shutdown videos. A lot of people are in shutdown, stuck in shutdown. And there's also a lot of support for them. It's, it's kind of cool to see the the love and the support for people. Um, and, the, and the shared experiences of shutdown. So I guess the point is, thank you. And I, I know there's people listening and, and benefiting from this. So thank you to my respondents. And thank you, dear listener, for joining me on Stuck Not Broken. If you're ready to take the next steps in compassionately coming out of shutdown, I have the perfect course for you. It's called Shutdown to Stillness, More Inner Peace in Four Weeks. It teaches you how to combine your shutdown state with safety resulting in stillness. It covers validating, normalizing, and even giving permission for your shutdown to exist with safety. And it not only covers these as far as teaching, but we do light practices, ever so light practices. We we lightly practice validation and normalization and even giving your shutdown permission to be present. We feel into safety and we combine that with shutdown resulting in stillness. 
It's designed specifically for the person who is in shutdown and is starting their process of coming out of shutdown. When we come out of shutdown, the next step is it could be fight activation, flight fight activation, but fight in particular. But before that, stillness is more likely, or I think is ideal, combining safety with shutdown and stillness, and then accessing uh, the mobilization of flight fight uh, energy. So if we can get someone in stillness, that means that they can then be more curious, open, and mindful of returning sympathetic flight fight activation. Shutdown of stillness is in the Stuck Not Broken Total Access membership, along with three other courses, a wonderful private community, open Q&As, a second podcast, and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Visit justinlmft.com slash total access if you want to learn more about it, or if you want to join the Stuck Not Collective in the Stuck Not Broken Total Access membership. Again, justinlmft.com slash total access. I cannot wait to welcome you into the community. Bye. This podcast is not therapy, not intended to be therapy or be a replacement for therapy. Nothing in this creates or indicates a therapeutic relationship. Please consult with your therapist or seek for one in your area if you are experiencing mental health symptoms. Nothing in this podcast should be construed to be specific life advice. It is for educational and entertainment purposes only. More resources are available in the description of this episode and in the footer of justinlmft.com.